This is BBC One. A surgeon's laser as he spot welds at the retina of a human eye. Part of tomorrow's world today, the world of robots and now of mobots, of plastic skirts and paper shirts, the world of dialing nine for a drink. But let's start with today's world, the world of blackouts, or at any rate, reduced power, which produces the kind of light you might expect from a muscular glowworm. This week, once again, with the cold snap, came the cuts, electricity and gas. Tens of thousands of men idle in the Midlands yesterday because of the gas shortage. Altogether, 70 firms had to stop using gas and thousands of housewives had no choice. Their gas was stopped for them. And apparently we must go on expecting cuts for the next two years. But while his men are turning the taps off today, the chairman of the gas council, Sir Henry Jones, is getting all excited about the gas of tomorrow. The gas under the North Sea, a possible strike, in his own words, of Texas scale. So, today, candles. Tomorrow, natural gas. And a strike of Texas scale could revolutionise our lives far beyond the scope of the kitchen. Or could it? Professor Thring of Queen Mary's College, London, thinks it could do just this. Amanda G. Smythe of The Economist is a good deal less enthusiastic. In fact, if one could pour cold water on gas, that is precisely what she would like to do. We'll give them each two minutes. First, Professor Thring. If Britain is lucky enough to find immense quantities of natural gas, it will also be very cheap. And this will be of tremendous value to the country in two ways. First, as a chemical raw material, and second, of course, as a fuel. In terms of chemical raw material, it could mean that plastics became tremendously cheap, and so cheap, in fact, that we could use them for building our houses. We could use them on farms for irrigation and for water protection and many other purposes. We could even use them to act as solar distillation units in the desert using the sun and irrigate the whole of the deserts of the world. Similarly, fertilizers would become very much cheaper as a result of this. And finally, as an example in terms of chemical raw materials, to save the steel industry, iron making itself would become much cheaper if we no longer had to use coke but could use natural gas for reducing the iron ore. But the fuel uses would be also very exciting. After all, we spend nearly 10% of our national turnover on fuel and therefore a very cheap fuel would be of great value to the country in every way both in terms of manufacture and in terms of people in their houses heating them. I'll pick out just a few examples. First of all we could make electricity quite a bit cheaper if we had unlimited cheap fuel. We might even be able to develop considerably more efficient ways of making electricity through magnetohydrodynamics if we had natural gas which is the ideal fuel for this purpose. The Americans for a long time have been working on an idea for making electricity in their houses when they haven't got electricity supply by means of natural gas in fuel cells and this again we could do in places. Another example is that we could actually afford to use seawater distillation to make electricity and then distill the water with the uh, pass out heat from the steam turbines. I am most excited by the whole possibility. Well, if and when we do find the gas, the first thing we're going to have to do is to lay gas pipelines all over the country in a grid system probably, like electricity. At the moment gas doesn't run all over the country. Now this is going to be a very expensive and a very long task and 
Then after that, when we've finished with that, we've got to think of t turning our gas fittings in our homes. We'll have to change those completely. They've done it in Holland already, and this will mean that each household will spend between 15 and 20 pounds on having this done. We don't know who's going to pay for it yet, but it'll probably be the poor housewife, and she'll have all the horror and mess of having the man in her house changing the fittings. It's going to be a very messy business. Now, one of the areas which might benefit from this, first of all, would be the East Coast. This is where the gas will probably be found, and you might get some big industries moving up there, industries like the glass and the pottery industry, who, who use a lot of heat. Gas at the moment costs about two shillings a therm. It costs a shilling to produce and a shilling to distribute. Now, when we found the gas, it would still cost a shilling to distribute, but of course to produce it, it would be much cheaper. But still, it's going to cost about one and four a therm, which isn't sort of some magnificent difference, really. And then there's the question of balance of payments. Some people think that this is going to change the balance of payments enormously. But there is just one point, which is that gas will not be in direct competition with oil on the whole. It will in the sort of oil that we burn for our heaters, but not, on, not in a general way. And so the industry it probably would hit is the coal industry. And if the government, they may not allow this, of course, they may want to protect coal, but generally the poor old coal industry would be for the boot. Two precisely opposite points of view. Anyway, whatever the future, whether it's uh, driving down into gas or just straight through shoals of mackerel, the drilling under the North Sea goes on and goes down. But have you ever thought what happens when things go wrong? The problem of doing running repairs on the bed of the ocean. So far, the answer has been to send down a diver. But now, from America, comes another answer in tomorrow's world. You could, in fact, forget the diver. Instead, just send down a mobile. It's lowered from the drilling barge to the seabed, where it is to take over maintenance and elementary repair work on the wellhead for which divers were previously needed. Two television cameras peer into the murky water to feed pictures back to the operator on the barge who manoeuvres the Mobot into position by its twin propellers. With vice-like grips and spanners at the ready, the machine closes in on the wellhead. Above the Mobot's arm, one of the cameras is mounted like a telescopic sight. So far, only simple tasks can be performed, but a more advanced model is being developed. The Mobot here is being used in depths of up to 425 feet off the coast of Oregon. The second television camera is mounted on top of the Mobot. The black and white gauge shows the operator the angle of the camera and he can tilt it in any direction. Then it's just a question of manipulating the spanners and the job's as good as done. The human eye the most delicate and therefore the most easily damaged part of the body. But of recent years, surgeons have been able to perform more and more intricate eye operations. They can replace corneas, remove lenses suffering from cataract. But right at the back of the eye lies the retina. Now surgeons can at last reach through to the retina and operate upon it, using perhaps the most precise surgical of an instrument of all, light. This surgeon is using a beam of light to operate on the eye. This is a technique which is a big advance in eye surgery and we've come to Moorfields Eye Hospital in the City of London to see it being used. Now if we're to understand what's happening, we ought to look at what the eye is like and I've got a model here of the eye and I'm using my hands, my fingers here, to represent the eyelids. Um, behind the eyelids, the eye is quite a large ball. And this model we can take in half to see the inside structure. In front there's this transparent window. Behind that the lens, which lies behind the iris, in the, inside the pupil. The light is focused by this lens onto this light-sensitive membrane at the back here called the retina. Nerves collect the impulses from the light-sensitive cells here and conduct them to the optic nerve here which carries the messages to the brain. Blood vessels here bring blood to the eye and this is distributed by these little fine blood vessels that radiate out through the inside of the eye. The front of the eye here contains a fluid and here there's a jelly-like substance, the vitreous 
Now it's obvious that with his very delicate membrane, it's a great advantage to be able to operate on the eye without opening it. And this is what this light technique permits. And this is why the surgeon and I are not wearing masks or gloves. Could you explain exactly what it is that you're doing with this machine here? Yes, well, this machine has a very powerful bulb in this big lamp house, and it is mounted on the end of this tube. And the light comes down the tube and is reflected into the mirror, which is at the end here. And I think possibly you can see some of the light being reflected by that light, by the mirror. I reflect the light down into the patient's eye, and the natural focusing of the eye, the mechanism, focuses it to a tiny little point of light on the back of the eye, and the dark velvety membrane at the back of the eye receives the light and converts it into heat, and this heat is transmitted to the retina through which it has passed and to the other tissues. Uh, and what does it actually do to the tissues, the heat? It produces a very tiny little burn and is rather like spot welding these tissues together. How strong is this light? The light at the moment that I've been using is about three times the brightness of the sun at the Earth's surface. And do you have to have an anesthetic? Yes, the patient has an anesthetic given to him behind the eye before he comes to the theatre. The point of this is so that the, uh, the light doesn't seem so bright to him and also so that the uh, eye muscles don't move the eye about so that I have complete control of where I'm putting the light. And what are you actually treating in this patient? This patient has a series of little swellings in one area on the one area of the retina, the little swellings on the blood vessels. And these little swellings are rather weak, and if he were to exert himself very badly or <coughs> cough violently, they might produce a hemorrhage and um, possibly cause him to be blind. So to sum it up, you're passing strong light through the eye, it's turned into heat at the back without affecting the front of the eye at all. Yes and this is coagulating these little blood vessels and saving a possible loss of vision later. Certainly, yes, Preventive so. treatment. Yes. Uh, Dr. Carroll, uh, what do you feel when he turns his light on? Do you feel anything? Almost nothing. <coughs> very, very slight uh, pain at the end of the flash. Do you, does the eye light seem very bright to you or just ordinary bright? Not excessively, just just uh, very bright, really. So it's not a distressing experience at all? No, not at all. Uh, now, what other conditions can you treat with this method? We can treat <coughs> conditions where the retina is ointment-based, very thin, and um, there may even be holes in the retina whilst the retina is still flat, and the holes are potential sources of danger in that they may leak. The vitreous, which you were talking about, becomes degenerate and fluid, little sedative sister, and this degenerate fluid can leak through the hole in the retina and peel it off the back wall, rather like if you tore a, a piece of wallpaper and it was damp, then you could strip the whole wallpaper off the wall. And with this technique, you can just stick the retina so he can't come away. Yes. And, and this saves the, the patient's sight. Yes, it does. Now, in the old days, before you had this technique, could you do this by ordinary surgery, by stitching? Oh, no. You can't sew this tissue because it is far too delicate and it's rather like trying to sew something like uh, wet cobweb. It's just not possible. So this is a new technique, which is uh, such a simple operation. The patient is even just wearing his shirt, you see, and this is saving people's sight all the time. This patient has one of these weak spots in his retina, which is rather centrally placed, and so a new technique, a newer technique, which is under trial here at Moorfields, is going to be used. This uses the laser, which stands for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. And this produces the most intense form of light known on Earth. And here it is in this quite compact little device. Could you explain just what, how it works? Now, in this handle, there is a ruby crystal which is machined into the form of a rod. 
Next door to this rod, which is about three inches long, there is a, an electronic flash tube. This flash tube, when it flashes, energizes the particles inside the ruby, and the ruby crystal particles get uh, very excited and emit a very powerful and rapid beam of red light up through the instrument and it goes through an optical system and is directed down through the patient's receiving hole at the bottom of the instrument. I can look along that beam of light through my side of the instrument and direct this beam of light into exactly the position at the back of the eye that I want it. So we have the light amplification by stimulated emission in here yes. and the radiation, the radiation comes, out. comes out. And this radiation comes out at a very, very rapid rate. Uh, this instrument was, um, is, is on, on uh, trial here and was developed in Newcastle on time at the Royal Victoria Infirmary. Now, before we begin, perhaps I could just explain, using our model again, uh, exactly where this patient's trouble is. In the other patients, the blood vessels out at the edge of the retina here were affected. Isn't that right? Yes, it's so. And this patient, I gather from you, has his weak spot in the central part just about there. Is that yes. right? Yes. Very near the central part of the back of the eye where the detailed seeing is done. Therefore, we need to be very much more careful and delicate in our applications of treatment so as not to damage parts of the eye that the patient needs, needs to use for his everyday life. A few more little applications, Mr. Shopsaw. Each of those flashes lasts for about... Just a over. few thousandths of a second. So that the light is come and the reaction produced and gone before ever the patient has time to blink. What I'm doing now is to ring round this little hole in the retina so that it can't leak and so that the little area is made quite secure and no retinal detachment can result from this retinal hole. Can you tell me what did you actually feel and see during this? I could feel the surgeon's hands on me and around my face, but I couldn't feel anything else. And I didn't see anything at all. I heard the, like a box shutting and spark, but I knew nothing. I didn't you didn't see, even see the flashes of light? No. So here at Moorfields, we see the surgeons using light to operate on the eye without opening it, so that the patient can, for the rest of their lives, enjoy using light for their everyday vision. Now don't worry, we haven't blown the roof off the television center yet. In fact, uh, all this is the product of a wind machine, at the moment blowing about uh, 10 knots, I should think, 12 miles an hour thereabouts. And to get blown about like this, I could be standing on a slice of exposed moorland where the wind would be blowing at about the same speed wherever I stood. Or I could be standing at the back of a tall building while just around the corner, about 50 yards away or so, there might hardly be any wind blowing at all. And that odd fact is beginning to worry some people more and more. If you haven't been around this world very long, large things can take on considerable significance in your life. If you're very small, then a small Victorian villa in a small Victorian row feels pretty overpowering. But if one day you find yourself with a new neighbor, its effect might be devastating. For example, it might well have delusions of grandeur of which you don't entirely approve. The monster might well block your view from the back bedroom. Or it might well be that it simply makes you feel small. 
but get a whole group of these pillars of society around you, as they have at Notting Hill Gate in London, and you'll notice another problem, wind. Where does it come from? Where does it go? What effect does it have on the way? One effect is that it's unpleasant to live with. And some housewives in the Notting Hill Gate area have changed their shopping habits to avoid it. Another effect is the dangerous force a high wind can have on tall buildings if the conditions are critical. To begin to find out just what does happen, the building research station has built a wind tunnel to test wind effects on model buildings. Some of the results they get, to say the least, must provoke a little thought for people who live in and among high places. For example, if we take a single tower representing a building 160 feet high, the velocity of the vortex, or the whirlwind, in front of the tower is found to be the same as the wind velocity in the free airspace at the side of the building. But if we change the shape of the building under test by putting a long slab-type block, the same height as before, in place of the tower, then with the same wind flow, the vortex velocity decreases to a relative value of 0.8. A model of a smaller building, representing a slab block 40 feet high, produces lower speeds of 0.2 relative to the values found with the tall building. Suppose now we built a second 40 foot high model block of flats behind the first. The relative velocity between the two rises to 0.7, but stays at 0.2 in front of the first block. Put in a third block and the same thing happens. The relative velocity between the first two buildings is 0.7 and between the second and third, 0.7. But what happens when you put a tall slab behind a smaller one? Here, the vortex speed in front of the small building is still at its old level of 0.2. But between the small and the large, it reaches the surprisingly high value of 1.3. Almost double that between two small buildings. Some engineers claim that the wind speeds can be sufficiently high to suck out the windows at the back of the smaller building, and where they know that this effect will operate, take appropriate steps and reinforce the glass under strain. The moral from this story is obvious enough. If you want to know what effect wind is going to have on and around tall structures, it's no use considering individual structures in a group. You've got to consider the group as a whole. This is a group of cooling towers at Rugeley in Staffordshire, an imposing quorum of sweeps of steel and concrete. Though not necessarily of the same design, they're typical of towers being built up and down the country. So far, these symbols of power of the 20th century have withstood any storm and gale nature could concoct. But it's only in the past year that various designs of cooling towers have been tested in wind tunnels. It was shown several months ago that if tyres failed, they would do so rapidly and entirely without warning. And some cooling tyres have failed. Using a group of 350-foot tyres like a coconut shy, a Yorkshire gale of two weeks ago felled two at almost the same time and a third a few minutes later. An inquiry into the disaster at Ferrybridge is now being held. The committee of inquiry might find that the collapse was due to faulty structure, faulty sighting, or the wind's velocity. It will have to face that the design of the coolers had not been given wind tunnel tests, either as single tyres or in groups. But if it comes to that, what buildings have been tested in groups? The Barbican area in London is going to be as pretty a scheme of modern planning as some planners could wish. But facilities are still not available for the large-scale wind tunnel experiments which would be necessary to test the group of buildings as a whole or the nearby buildings they back up against. Engineers settle their consciences by simply widely overestimating the margin of safety necessary to withstand high winds. As one engineer on the scheme said, as yet it's nobody's business anywhere to find out what the effect of a gale is going to be on the next door buildings. And there are some places where it's been nobody's business for years and years. New York, for example. So far, the engineer's margins of safety have been generous, and the Manhattan skyline has shown no signs of crumbling whatever. But if you live next door to a skyscraper, 
Would you be happy to leave it to chance? And this week in the House of Lords, Lord Stonham, the Under Secretary at the Home Office, admitted that no wind tunnel tests had been carried out on those cooling towers at Ferrybridge. If there had been, they might still be standing. But now, a vital part of tomorrow's world, tomorrow's girl. What will future science and technology do for her? Or perhaps more to the point, what will she do with future science and technology? Tomorrow's girl could well look something like this which is uh, very encouraging for a start. But on her head, no hair, a nylon wig, just a quick wipe with a damp cloth and your head's as good as new. You notice the shirt with no collar, but that is made of paper, just the thing for jotting down telephone numbers. In fact, you could uh, make notes all over yourself. The jacket and skirt uh, in plastic, uh, the sort of material that they used for covering kitchen tables not so very long ago and the shoes are also in synthetic leather and if the synthetic weather should prove unreliable why then we have a plastic Macintosh with these uh, extremely interesting transparent pockets to discourage you from loading them up with all sorts of junk as for the face of tomorrow's girl well if tomorrow is a trifle long coming and she meets it with wrinkles around the eyes then she can rub in anti-wrinkle cream made of proteins from animals' blood and emerge as smooth as new. Oh, and uh, one other thing, the earrings. On Tomorrow's Girl, they wouldn't just be earrings. They'd be tiny transistor radios, light program for one ear, third for the other, uh, every taste catered for. And if you meet this girl and take her out for a drink, why, where would you go? Obviously, to the pub of Tomorrow's World, the place where you dial nine for a drink. The pub of the future, Mark One, at Hackney Wick. In this pub, the question, what will you have? Tonic, please. I think I'll just stick with a light ale. A nice scotch and soda. Leads to the unexpected. Press the button for a line. According to the directory, dial 145 for a gin and tonic, 169 for a double whiskey, 187 for a Bloody Mary. And if you want something unusual, like two cherries and a cube of ice, dial 100 for the waiter if you want him in person. Because this is an automated pub. At the other end of the line, it's a pint-sized computer that tells the barman what to pour and also adds up the bill. Every drink has a code, so does the table that placed the order. No difficulty catching the waiter's eye. It saves staff, time, gives better service and all the rest of it. Nothing is safe from the tide of automation, not even the local. The prototype has finished its tests and the first machine is being installed in London today. Theoretically, you could dial for anything, anywhere. It could be used in hospitals, for room service in hotels. In restaurants, you could dial your whole dinner, if you like, right down to the souffle. But how do you dial a fly out of your soup? Anyway, we're off to find a waiter. Good night. Oh, by the way, we shall be back same time next week with a preview of some more things from tomorrow's work.